भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदा स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शांति 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 and we were doing the seventh mantra so i'll chant the seventh mantra please follow after me nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam no bhayata pragyam na pragyana ganam na pragyam na pragyam अदृष्ट अव्यवहार्य अग्राह्यमलक्षण अचिंत्यवेश्यम प्रत्ययसार प्रपंचोपशम शात शिवद्वैत चतुर्थ मे स आत्मा स विज्ञेय सो सेवेंथ मंत्र विच वी वर डूइंग इज दिस इज द रियल नेचर ऑफ द सेल्फ दिस इज द एक्चुअल थिंग दट द मांडो की उपनिषद वॉन्ट्स टू टीच आदि शंकराचार्य इन इज कमेंट्री यू नो द टेक्स्ट इज स्ट्रक्चर्ड इन दिस वे द उपनिषद देन गौड़पाद स्कारिकाज and then shankaracharya's commentary so in the beginning of his commentary adi shankaracharya on this mandukya upanishad and karika the first thing he says is this thing which we are going to start now sarva vedanta sara sangraha bhutam these these four chapters which we are going to study now are the collection of the essence of the entirety of vedanta so all vedanta is summarized in these four chapters and all of this is summarized or this is the essence is of that essence is in the seventh mantra when we started studying this we were told that all our problems will be solved if you if we know ourselves as we truly are meaning thereby we do not know ourselves as we truly are so we need to know the reality of ourselves how do you do that by an inquiry into ourselves what is the process for that inquiry the special process mentioned here in the mandukya upanishad is the method of the three states waking dreaming and deep sleep it said that you have four aspects one aspect of yourself is you the waker and your waking world the second aspect is when you dream and your dream world and the third aspect is when you are in deep sleep and your the the merged world of the deep sleep the potential world of the deep sleep those are the three aspects and now we come and there is a fourth aspect which is what you really are and now we have come to the fourth aspect um we had seen that this mantra you can analyze it into three parts the the first and the second parts are negation neti neti not this not this and the third part which we shall enter today the third part is an affirmation it points out what we are the first two parts are what we are not the third part is what we are in the first two parts um what was denied neti neti is not this not this what was denied is remember in the first three aspects of the self which we talked about the book talked about in each aspect waking dreaming and deep sleep there is the knower and the known pramata prameya pairs in each one there is a, a pair what is the pair you the knower and the world that you know like right now for example here you are you are the knower and here is the world that you know 
So you are the knower pramata and there is the prameya. Knower and known pair. The waker and the waker's world. A pair. In the dream also exactly the same thing. You are there and you know a dream world. So there is a pair. And in the deep sleep also there is a pair. Uh, we actually do not experience it that way. But just for symmetry let's put it this way. That you are there as the knower. Except that you do not have any instrument of knowing. So it's not an experience that I know deep sleep. It's all merged into, um, sort of lumped into a oneness. And the subject and object are not clearly divided in deep sleep. But still, you can conceive of a pair. What is the pair? The knower in deep sleep. And what does the knower know? A merged universe. There is no distinct knowledge in, in deep sleep. So these three pairs, knower, known pair, they are being denied here. The first part of, in the first part, second part, the knower and known pairs are being denied. How are they denied? First, the knower is denied. The knower in waking state, it says, you are not the waker. The knower in dream state, you are not the dreamer. The so-called knower within quotes, in deep sleep state, you are not the deep sleeper. But how does it start off, do you see? Not the consciousness which is turned inwards. Who is that? The dreamer. Nanta Pragyam. Did you see the first words? Nanta Pragyam. No, not the con- you are not the consciousness which is turned inwards. Not the dreamer. Na Bahish Pragyam. You are not the consciousness which is turned outwards. You are not the waker. Na uh, Pragyana Ghanam. You are not the consciousness which is a mass of uh, in, uh, of indistinct awareness, deep sleeper. You are not the deep sleeper. And then it also goes on to add other possibilities. You are not the, uh, you are not something in between. Often questions had come here, uh, what a, why only waker, dreamer and sleeper? Why not something in between, like somebody has a coma, or some, somebody, uh, some state between waking and dreaming, or some mystical state where you experience, um, you know, God in some form. What about all of those states? Those are also denied. No bhayata pragyam. Not something in between either. What about the, the, the omniscient mind of God which you know everything? Is it, do you mean that? No, not that. We are not talking about God. So it denies that. Na pragyam. It denies that. That sarvagya, all knowing consciousness of God, uh, awareness of God. That also is not what we are talking about here. Na aprag- so, so no awareness? Like a rock or a stone, nothing? No, we are not talking about that either. So, all of them are denied. The, you, the knower which is familiar to us, the first half of the pair of the knower and known, that is denied. Then in the second part, adrishtam abhyavaharyam, it is not perceptible to any of the senses. It is not available for any kind of transaction or use. Agrahyam, it's not perceptible, it's not graspable by the organs of um, action. Motor organs. So, all of that is denied. What, is, what are they denying? They are denying the knowable. Yeah, it's not anything that is knowable. The two pairs, knower and known. So, here, the, what you see here, these are all Knowable. knowables. You can either, you, you can, they are available to your sight or smell or taste or touch uh, or, or hearing. Or you can go and touch them, uh, you, I mean you can grasp them, you can walk to them, you can talk about it. This is your knowable universe. This is also denied. It's, no, it's nothing here. None of these. So the knower known pairs are denied. And then we come to the third one, third part of the mantra, starting from Ekatma Pratyasaram. This is what we shall see today. Here it takes a turn towards the positive. It's now trying to indicate what the Turiyam is, the fourth, the so-called fourth, what it is really is, what your real nature is. Remember, here it comes the real teaching of the Upanishad. The waker and the dreaming and sleeping is not the real teaching of the Upanishad. It is just labeling our, our common experiences. It is using those experiences to point to, to something hidden behind the experiences. If I use the Jewelry in a, in, a, in a jeweler's shop to point to the material gold. I'm not really interested in the ring or the, or the necklace or the 
um, the, the bracelet. I'm interested in the material gold. But unless some, I can use those jewels, I can't point out the gold either. Similarly, the three knowers and the three knowables are being used to point out the reality hidden by them, which is behind them, so to say. Um, that is being pointed out. Why I'm using the language pointed out? You see, it cannot be said. If it could be said, it would have been said directly. But it can't be said. In fact, uh, Shankaracharya, when he starts commenting on this one, on this mantra, the, the commentary of Shankaracharya on this mantra starts with uh, an objection. The objection is very interesting. The objection is, you said, wait a minute, you said that the way of self-enquiry is that the self has four aspects. Let us examine each aspect one by one. And when you wanted to speak about the waker, you said waker, dreamer, sleeper and turiyam, the fourth, right? So when you wanted to talk about the waker, do you remember the third mantra? What did you do? You went straight ahead and talked about the waker. Bahish pragyam, the, uh, the, the one whose awareness is externalized and who experiences the external world. You straight away talked about the waker. When you wanted to talk about the dreamer, you straight away talked about the dreamer. The, your consciousness internalized, turned away from the external world and you dream something in your mind. That's the dreamer. So directly you talked about it. Now, when you're going to talk about the fourth, Turiyam, talk about it. Why are you doing this strange thing? You start off by saying, it's not the waker, it's not the dreamer, it's not the sleeper. What's going on? You want to talk about the fourth? Talk about the fourth. Why are you doing this? There is a reason for that. The reason is there is no other way. There is no other way. If I want to point out the gold to you, I have to bring out the necklace. See, it's like I said to you, here you have three ornaments, a necklace, a, a bracelet and a ring. But the reality is gold. Reality is a fourth one. If I say fourth. And then I bring out the ring or the bracelet and show it to you. Now look here carefully. You can object. Just a minute. You said the reality is the fourth. So remove these and talk about the fourth. When you talk about the necklace, you show me the necklace. When you talk about the uh, bracelet, you show me the bracelet. When you talk about the ring, you display the ring. When you talk about gold, show me gold. Why are you bringing up the necklace and the, and the, and the ring again? Because there is no other way. The gold is right there. Isn't it? You have to use that thing. So you have to use this waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Use it how? By denying them. By bringing them forward and saying, it's not this. Okay. But you said it's immeasurable. Yes. So there is something that you have to deny here and something that you have to affirm. What has to be denied has already been denied. It's not the knower. It's not the known. It's not the waker, not the waking universe. And that's all we are familiar with. That's all we are comfortable with in the world. And that's being denied. And yet something will be left over in each case. That's we are going to try to point that out. Why I'm saying this is because language cannot be used directly. So a technique has been, uh, this is the technique to point this out. There is an, an ancient saying, um, yuk, Yuktya prabud, prabudhyate mudaha. Um, Tattvena prabuddhyate, tattvena buddhyate pragyaha. The, the, the foolish, the less competent student has to be convinced with philosophy and reason and logic. The more competent, mature student, it's enough if you point out the truth to him. You cannot tell the truth. If you tell the truth, that's simple enough. But you can't because it, the, the truth, language can't express the truth. Now what can you do? One is you can point it out with philosophy, with logic. Which is what most of Advaita Vedanta is. All this sophisticated reasoning you come across, all the teachings that I do here. Most of it is reasoning and philosophy. Why I am not the body. Seven reasons to show why I am not the body and so on and so forth. Uh, we might think this is fascinating. It is said to be the 
Dr. Radhakrishnan said, it's the fairest flower of Indian philosophy, Advaita Vedanta. But the Vedantins themselves have this saying, it is for the foolish. It is for the less uh, nimna adhikari, lower adhikari, the lower, the less competent student. Then what is the what is the method for the competent student? The method for the competent student is pointing it out. Like Chinese have a saying, a finger pointing to the moon. The fool, if you f- point the finger to the moon, the f- f- a fool will think that the finger is the moon and keep staring there. Not this. What it is pointing to. Similarly, what this seventh mantra is a pointer. So it's the seventh mantra is a pointer. It points to something which we must grasp. Yes. I mean, there's, as you already know, some foolish philosophers who even deny consciousness itself. Yes. Like if, you, if you deny consciousness itself, then you deny the existence because existence precedes consciousness. Correct. I mean, that's beyond foolish right there. Right. But it's incredible how... Um, how some pretty smart people, really smart people, it leads me to wonder, are they zombies? They say the, the brain is everything. There's nothing other than the brain. But the very simple thing, when you taste a cup of coffee, now the, what is happening is neurons are firing in your brain. There's no doubt about it when you are having the conscious experience of tasting the cup of coffee. But if you ask me, I'm not experiencing neurons firing. I'm experiencing coffee. I'm experiencing taste, warmth, smell, fragrance. And the brain, there is some neurochemical activity going on in the brain. That is true. How the two are related, you can't deny completely my experience. If you deny my experience, you're denying the conscious experience of everybody. You're denying life itself. You're denying the whole of uh, human experience, of, of all kinds of experience. In fact, the universe goes dark if you say that. Uh-huh. And there are people who actually deny that. The, this ha- hard problem of consciousness. I might be one of those zombies. Mm. Because my question is, if it cannot be seen, if it cannot be heard, yeah. if it cannot be uh, thought, yes. if it cannot be... So none of the human faculties... Yes. Can let you experience the Korean. No. In which case, how do how do people know that it exists? Because you can hear, smell, think, talk, and you have no other way of explaining how. There is a bangle. There must be gold. Yes, and it, there is no other way of explaining how you can hear, smell, talk, think. The way of explaining this by by saying that the brain does everything is no explanation. Yes. Think about something. I mean, you look at the Eastern world and the Western world. You know, nowadays with technology, so so many people are so stimulated with everything. It's like you ask them, when was the last time you, you know, per se, spent time alone with no gadgets, nothing alone, in quietness and solitude, and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, that's what Robert Christian constantly, constantly advises people. Right, right, right. One of the reasons why this is called Mandukya Upanishad. Manduka means a frog. So there's one interesting story. It's it's that the story means there's an interesting example. A frog, when it leaps, it draws back a little, and then jumps forward. Right. So in order to take the spiritual leap, you must draw back a little from the world. Step back a little from the world. This continuous, now you have to take two steps back. Earlier people had to step back from the material world. You have to step back from the virtual world into the material world and from the material world into... (laughs) Yes. So you deny both the knower as well as the known. Yes. Known is easily denied. Yes. But how do you make the distinction between the knower and the consciousness itself? Yes, we'll do that. We'll see that. Knower and the consciousness itself. So, um, just a direct answer to your question would be what she asked, that if you cannot smell it, touch it, taste it, you cannot think about it, you cannot talk about it, then how do you know at all that 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 thing is there? And the answer is, that which enables you to smell, touch, talk, think uh, about anything, that one light shining through all of these activities, that, that in this way you can know about it. 
you can't know about it as an object. Uh, in the Kena Upanishad, the eye of the eye, the ear of the ear. Uh, all right. Now, so this is, I wanted to say that this is a pointing, a pointing out. This is, this is beyond logic and reasoning. If you're not convinced, we will give you logic and reasoning. We'll give you Advaita philosophy. People think that's the final, but that's actually, they say that it's just for uh, people who, who are, I mean, philosophy is for people who are dumb. <laughs> that's what he's saying. For the people who are intelligent, just a pointing out should be enough. Um, if I still don't get it, after all that philosophy, I'm just bewildered. What, what, I don't get it. What are you saying? Then, I will re then Vedanta recommends meditation. Here, I'll give you a mantra. Repeat it. If that makes me fall asleep, then Vedanta recommends. Then you have, you have pujas and uh, elaborate rituals and, uh, uh, and uh, do, go ahead and do unselfish work and all of that. Uh, and engage yourself in... Uh, here is a deity to whom you can, I will give you a form to look at and you can worship it. And so there are graded levels. In, it reminds me of Kashmir Shaivism, where they have, it's, it's, a, it's a different philosophy, it's not Advaita Vedanta. But one in, interesting feature of Kashmir Shaivism is they have four graded levels, four, four ways, so to speak, about. So in Kashmir Shaivism, they speak about the highest way is. Anupai. Anupai means no way way. No way way doesn't mean that there's no way. It means that it's no particular way. You just become enlightened straight away. That's the highest, obviously. But you can't sit around waiting for it. So a way is necessary. The second one is they call the Shambhava Upai. The way of Shambhu or Shiva. The way of Shiva. Which is equivalent to our Advaita Vedanta. It's a way of knowledge. The third way is Shakta Upai. The way of Shakti, of power, of Divine Mother. Which is which? Where you take the help of mantra and meditation. So that's only the third way, and the last way is called anva upai. Anva means the anu means the 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 jiva, the individual, the atom, or the individual, the the, the infinitesimally small individual us. So based upon us. So what is that way? That way is full of rituals, full of activities and rituals and chants and pujas and things like that. And many 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 techniques are there. The last one is the most complicated and most time-taking. The third one uh, is less time-taking and powerful. The second one is even more powerful and, and very short. You just have to know you are it. That's it. It's done. And the first one, of course, is instantaneous. But the first, then, but the first one is you can't. There is no condition to it. it. Might be the grace of God. Maybe the grace of Guru. The people spontaneously awaken. Yeah. Sometimes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's the third, the Shakta Upaya. Shakta Upaya. That also, now remember, in all of these Upayas, they all lead to the same realization. It's not that if I have to take a, a simpler path or a more physical path, like say doing a puja, that will lead me to a lower grade of realization. You know, Brahman minus a subpar kind of <laughs> uh, uh, a, a, a sale Brahman, you know, which is you're being given, given at a discount. No, it will lead to the, exactly the same realization. And Sri Ramakrishna's life, it shows. He started off by being a simple pujari. Actually had an image of Kali and he did actual puja with chants and flowers and water offerings and food offerings. And he would sing songs. So every level of worship he shows. Right up to the highest. Alright. Now let's go on to the third part of the seventh mantra. Which we were doing. It goes like this. The first part was, Nanta Pragyam, it is not the dreamer, na Bahish Pragyam, not the waker, no Bhayata Pragyam, nothing in between, na Pragyanaghanam, not the deep sleeper, na Pragyam, not the omniscience of God, na Pragyam, not an inert, insentient thing either, Adrishtam, it is not available to any sense organ, Abhyabhariyam, not available for any use or transaction, Agrahiyam, not available for any motor organ, Alakshanam, it cannot be inferred. Achintyam, you cannot even conceive of it. Abhyapadeshyam, it cannot be spoken about. Done. Knower and known, denied. And what is it? Now it starts. 
ekatma pratyasaram so ekatma pratyasaram is the next the next word which comes so let's see what it means oh i don't feel like rubbing this this is so nice <laughs> all right i won't rub it i'll just speak about it ekatma pratyasaram how do they translate that which whose valid proof consists in the single belief in the self again not happy but let's put it this way ek atma pratyaya saram split up the word in in three parts saram means tracing a clue an indicator again a pointer there is only one clue one pointer one trace which you have to get hold of what is that atma pratyaya the self cognition in the form of i this i cognition which we have the i experience which we have when all the time you have it in the waking right now you feel i i am sitting here i am listening to a vedanta class i am a man or a woman i am feeling uh, i was feeling cold outside i came by the subway i am happy i am unhappy um i am excited i am bored uh, so i this continuous all throughout i am worldly i am spiritual i am interested i am uninterested all of that i is common to it this i cognition i experience which we have all the time in the waking we have it in the dream also i am seeing all of this later you wake up and say it was all false it was a dream but you felt i there and in deep sleep too in deep sleep and during deep sleep nobody feels i am sleeping but when you wake up and you look back what did you say what do you say i slept so there was no actual thinking at that time because the mind was shut down but after waking up you claim that sleep for whom for the i vertical high not e y e this one so i cognition is common to all it is one and unchanging so this one and unchanging i cognition this is the trace the clue the pointer towards the fourth turiyam how is it a pointer what is the process how do you get hold of it and find out the fourth the the clue is ek look at the word ek atma pratyaya saram ek atma pratyaya saram that's the long you know long words in sanskrit the oneness of the i cognition the way he has put it is the single belief in the self not single belief in the self it's the oneness of the i cognition throughout our lives hold on to that and notice something about it what happens that whatever happens all our lives it's basically you are adding attributes lot of things attributes which come and go childhood till now i was a baby i was a child i was a teenager i was a young man i'm a middle aged man i'm i'm an old man baby teenager mi- young middle aged old they have come and gone the i continues or i am um, american i am indian i am um, in the northern hemispheres your physical location changes the i continues right mental states i am happy i am unhappy i am depressed i understand i do not understand i remember i do not i forget remembering forgetting understanding confusion liking disliking happy unhappy they have all come and gone they all revolve around around that central i cognition these attributes come and go note this second note that there is something common which lasts all throughout what is that thing which is common which lasts all throughout that i i is common but what is that in i which lasts which is common which lasts throughout everything throughout babyhood teenage youth middle age old age 
in health and in disease, in happiness and in misery, in understanding and confusion, in remembering and forgetting, in desiring and in peace, in meditation and in excitement, in your virtual world involvement and distraction and in the withdrawn deep peacefulness of meditation, in everything, what is the one thing that unwaveringly continues? The experiencer. But what is the, yeah, what is, put these two together. She said experience and she said awareness. True. She's experiencer. The I, that means the I, it continues. But what is the nature of the I? Awareness continues. Consciousness continues. The attributes of consciousness come and go. That consciousness, note that, that consciousness is not attached to any of the attributes, properties, qualities which come and go. Put it this way. We always experience the I as I am X. I am X. And in the place of X you can put anything. I am X. In the place of X you put anything. Happy, sad, tall, short, rich, poor, remembering, forgetting, desiring, peaceful, whatever you want to put. Now, Bracket this aside and for the time being focus on the I am. You will see if you drop the X, if you bracket it aside mentally, you can't physically stop it. Mentally, you will see what you are left with is consciousness, is awareness, is a pure bright light of awareness without any kind of coloration. The coloration comes and goes. Now, noticing this, this, Continuous, unchanging consciousness. This is the clue. This is the clue. Minus all attributes. Minus attributes means you are not supposed to erase all attributes. The attributes, the qualities, the experiences, they come and go. The awareness in which they come and go is one and constant. I remember in Canada when I was giving a retreat, just outside my um, room there was this beautiful lake. And early in the morning, I would see the bright sun, sun in, in the lake. You would see a blue sky and you would see a bright sun. And then it, if it got cloudy, it would be dark and clouds in the, in the lake itself. And at night, maybe you would see a, the dark sky, maybe with a shining moon in the lake, in the lake itself. So what is there in the lake? I see blue skies and sun, I see cloudy skies, I see darkness with the moon and it revolves. And yet the truth is, there is no blue sky or sun in the lake. There never were, were any clouds in the lake. There never was any dark sky or uh, moon in the lake. In the lake. What was there all throughout, unchanging? Water. Water. That's what, is what we are saying now. It's not waking, it's not dreaming, it's not even deep sleep, it's just consciousness. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep are because of the activity of the mind. Activity of the mind generates waking and dreaming. Inactivity of the mind gives you the experience of deep sleep. And yet, in all of them, unchanging is awareness. So this is the meaning of Ekatma Pratyasaram. The whole approach of Mandukya Upanishad, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, is basically to enable you to see that the awareness is associated with waking, dreaming, deep sleep experiences. Then mentally, with an act of understanding, drop mentally, waking, dreaming and deep sleep and be aware of awareness. There is no other way of putting it. Sri Ramakrishna used this term. What exactly happens at enlightenment? Because you can't know it with the mind. He says, Bodhe Bodhai. The re consciousness realizes itself. Bodha means consciousness. Consciousness, conscious, conscious of itself. Then there's no other way of explaining it. It's not consciousness con uh, knowing itself with the mind. It's not consciousness seeing itself with the eyes or touching itself with the hand. It's consciousness without hands or eyes or mind aware of itself through awareness that is enlightenment 
It is just the water, whether early morning or whether cloudy skies or whether night and the moon, none of them are actually there in the water. It's just the water all the time. Though you see all the time, this is happening. Okay. So, keeping this aside mentally, intellectually for the time being, focus your attention on this. Our attention goes so much to the experienced world that we forget the consciousness in which all this is experienced. Our attention goes so much to the bright blue sky and the sun, we forget that it's in a lake. Our experience goes so much to the beautiful moon in the dark sky, we forget that the water itself is there, the water is so still, we forget that the water is there. Uh, first, it must be pointed out, it is water. First, we'll say, oh, okay, blue sky and sun in the water. That is first step. Second step is, deny the blue sky and sun also, even while seeing it. There is no blue sky and sun there in the water. Okay. So that is called Ekatma Pratyasaram. Now, we shall go into, because it is so, the next word is Prapanchopashamam. We'll see. Prapanchopashamam. What is Prapanchopashamam? Prapancha means universe. Upashamam is a beautiful word. The silence of the universe. You are the fourth, that awareness in which the universe falls silent. It means the cessation of the universe. It is translated as where all phenomena cease. That's how it's translated. It's a dry philosophical way of putting it. But it literally means the word itself. Prapancha, upashama means cessation, quietude, quiescence, silence, ceasing. Ceasing of the universe. So, prapancha upashamam. What universe? Three universes, not one. The physical universe of waking. Then, the dream universe, the subtle universe. And the deep sleep, the merged universe of deep sleep. In Sanskrit, sthula sukshma karana prapancha. Sthula prapancha, the gross universe, physical waking universe. Sukshma prapancha is the dream universe, subtle universe. Karana prapancha, the causal universe of deep sleep. So, all three are actually not there. Where? In the fourth, in the awareness which you are. Just like, remember the lake? Remember the lake example? The sun and the blue sky is not there in the lake. It isn't. Just water. I'll come to you. The cloudy skies, the clouds are not there in the lake. Just water. And the moon and the dark sky, not there in the lake. Just water. So just like that, the entire waking phenomena, the entire dream phenomena, and the merged um, causal state of deep sleep are not there in the awareness where they appear. So having said that, the song Bring Our Soul is the avatar. Yes. So I'll say, oh, I shall come back, reincarnate of humanity. Yeah. Uh, no, it isn't. When we would say, I want to go back to the dream to have pizza, it's something like pizza, it's something different from me. It's really there and I am this guy who loves pizza, so I need to have that pizza. That's ignorance. Whereas an enlightened person who might say, I want to come back, is that I myself in all these forms am suffering from ignorance. That might be the attitude. The suffering is real. No, that's why I'm, I'm distinguishing. I'm distinguishing the two. When I say I want the pizza, I clearly say I am this person and the pizza is different from me. And I need to put it in my mouth to enjoy the taste. That's why I need the pizza. I am a subject, that's an object. And it is a separate reality, that's why I need to add it to me. I will be complete. I will be full. If I eat the pizza. But... But the enlightened person doesn't see that way. The enlightened person sees, if I am the awareness, in me alone all of this is appearing. So that guy, all those people in the world, they are none other than me. Their suffering is my suffering. So that might be an attitude of an enlightened person. So I'll go back to help them to that realization which I have got already. So, 
Yeah. There's n- it comes from oneness. It does not come from difference. True, it might. There, there are enlightened people who might say that. It depends on the attitude. Remember, these are models, what we are talking about, to point you to an enlightenment. What will happen after you get enlightened? Will you look back upon the world and say, I need to help everybody and bring everybody to this beautiful place I am in this realization? You might, then you become a Buddha. Or will you say, it's all a dream. This oneness is all that exists. Let me merge into it and be there forever. Then you disappear beyond the range of human experience forever. Because in this realm of reality, the oneness, regardless of how you see it, is like... Yes, so they, they speak about enlightened people of three kinds. You say, okay, well, the jiva would say, I'm the glass of jar. You could say, okay, um, I know I'm the, the air inside the jar, the air outside the jar, the jar itself. So this world will be like, okay, I'm still... The jar is still there until I die. You know, you break the glass of jar. Is it something like that? Like, because Let's not go into different models. Let's just stick with what we are going here, right? So the, even the jar and the air, in, not the air inside, the space inside and space outside, that's the model. So that model, um, uh, you, can, you can apply it here. And the thing is... Uh, um, when you go, there's like the realm of paradoxes. There's, you, cannot, you cannot avoid paradoxes. You have to leave it be because uh, there is no compulsion after an enlightenment. An enlightened person has to help everybody. No, not necessarily. Yeah, it, because there's no, there's, the relative doesn't exist anymore. There's no relative. True, but, in but, but in the absolute also, see, they, they might feel... Uh, I've given the example of the wave and the ocean. There are reasons why an enlightened being might want to help others. And that's why they become the avatars and the buddhas. What I'm trying to say is that the enlightened avatars and the buddhas and all are enlightened beings. It's not that they don't know this and they have not realized it. They have and from that point of view they want to help us. They are not like, I'm responding to your pizza example. They are not like, there's pizza there and I'm going to go back and try to have it. Um, It's not like that. Three types of enlightened beings. Uh, Swami Gambiranji speaks about it in his essay um, on um, Karme Parinata Vedanta, I think. So he says, after enlightenment, uh, the liberated while living, Jivan Mukta, might have three kinds of attitudes, three different approaches. To what? To the world. One is, might completely ignore it, might, might want to remain in samadhi. Like uh, Vivekananda, when he got Nirvikalpa Samadhi and Sri Ramakrishna asked him, what do you want? He said, I want to remain in this state forever. Once in a while, come down and have a snack. But otherwise, I'll remain, <laughs> I'll remain in this state forever. I found it. I, I, want to, I want to be one with God. That's it. And Sri Ramakrishna condemned him for that. He said, uh, fie upon you. I thought you'll be this great tree under whose sh- shade thousands will find rest and succor. Uh, here you are only thinking about your own liberation. But that's not to say that's a low state. That's possibly the highest state that humanity can ever endeavor for. So that's incredible. Being one with the divinity. So that's possible too. That's one, one state. And uh, many enlightened persons would, would be satisfied with that. There's a second state where you don't ignore the world altogether. The world appearance is seen like magic. Like you see the sky in the lake. It's water. But how wonderful. Look, in the water there is a sun and a sky and clouds and birds and trees. Everything so clear in the water. It would feel like magic. And this person is delighted by it. These are usually the crazy men of God. They, they look like madmen to us. There was this person in Dakshineshwar, in the Kali temple, a yogi who would stay all day long meditating in his hut, but once in a while would come out of his hut and look at the temple and the river and the sky and and say, wow, wow, wonderful, wonderful, bravo, and go back into his (laughs) meditation. And there were a number of such crazy people who visited, enlightened people who visited Dakshineshwar. Um, There was a person 
would would rest in rags and long beard and unkempt looking and he had i think a plant in his hand a mango tree in his hand a little seedling a mango tree in his hand why nobody knows till today and he walked into the kali temple people thought he was mad he was mentally ill or something but when he walked into the kali temple he chanted a hymn to kali and in sri ramakrishna's words the whole temple vibrated it's like the mother you know came alive and you know looked at him so and sri ramakrishna said he was a fully enlightened being but uh, acting like a crazy person he said the whole temple shook with that uh, with with the chanting of that person so that's the second attitude towards the world a magic show and the third attitude is the enlightened person's heart melts with compassion here are all these beings and he recognizes they are none other than me he recognizes fully the feeling of oneness but i must lead them out of illusion into reality so that person becomes an avatar or of no that person doesn't become an avatar that person becomes a teacher world teacher yeah. the bodhisattva ideal for example anyway now we are we are we are now going to dismiss the world so prapancha upashama prapancha upashama means the quietude or cessation of the three universes gross universe subtle universe and the causal universe sthula sukshma karana prapancha trayam nisheda nisheda means negation now note one thing here i'm going to make two statements one is reality cannot be negated that which is cannot be negated and that which is not unreal need not be negated negated means what what do i mean by negated understood to be an appearance by knowledge falsified by knowledge take the example of this snake and the rope if it's a real snake no matter how much you keep saying it's it's a rope it's a rope it's not a snake it's nothing it's going to come and bite you it's uh, you cannot you cannot realize it to be false by an act of knowledge if it's really a snake okay and second if there is no snake that you see there no no false snake then there is no no need to negate anything no need to see the falsity of anything it's not there what needs to be negated the error called the snake are you with me there is really a rope i mistake it to be a snake and then i get scared then i need to be shown that it's not really a snake it's just a piece of rope it's harmless piece of rope that's necessary let me put it in another way mm. what needs to be corrected if somebody tells the truth there, there are three three things i'll tell you three statements somebody tells a truth somebody keeps silent somebody tells a lie which one needs to be corrected the third one the first one cannot be corrected because he has told the truth the second one need not be because he has not said anything silent third one needs to be corrected are you with me a lie needs to be corrected by the truth so in the same way the real cannot be challenged the real cannot be uh, negated cannot be challenged cannot be corrected the unreal need not be corrected yeah. it's like being silent if something is not there at all then you no need to talk about it no need to do philosophy or advaita about it but what needs to be corrected is something that is neither real nor unreal in sanskrit na sat na asat sat means that which is asat means that which is not is there anything in between which is neither is nor is not yes what is that for example the snake rope it is not there is no such thing as a, that 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 snake is not there but we cannot say that it's not there either because we saw it we may, so it's an it's, it's a mistake needs to be corrected a mirage water mirage water the water is not there it's not real but it's not unreal either because we saw it we saw something there we thought it's a water and it needs to be corrected because we are in error a dream nothing in the dream whatsoever happened when you wake up you say nothing happened it's just a dream 
good dream, bad dream, uh, um, nightmare. It didn't happen. But you cannot deny that you saw it. That you cannot deny. So it needs to be corrected that it's just a dream. It did not happen. So errors, dreams, illusions, they need to be corrected. The truth cannot be corrected. It's true. That which never is experienced need not be corrected. But that which is experienced um, wrongly, incorrectly, in illusion, in delusion, that needs to be corrected and that can be corrected by knowledge. Now, there the contention of Advaita Vedanta is the entire universe, physical universe, subtle universe, causal universe is exactly like this. It's not real like, like Brahman, pure existence, consciousness, bliss. It's not totally unreal also. It's neither real nor unreal. It can be experienced. We are experiencing it right now. Example, the blue sky and the sun which I saw in the lake. It's not real. There's no real blue sky or sun in the lake. It's just water. <coughs> but I saw it. I saw it. So that has to be corrected. There's no blue sky or lake there. Even after correction, what happens? What do I see? Blue sky and the bright sun in the lake. But I know it's just water. Every bit of it is water. In the same way, it has to be corrected that in that fourth, that pure consciousness in which all the attributes are coming and going, and that we saw ekatma pratyasaram, in that pure consciousness which you are, the three universes are not there. Physical universe, subtle universe, causal universe are not there, but they appear. This is not existing and yet experienced. There is a word in Sanskrit for this, mithya, false. Technically, the false is that which is not true and yet experienced. It's like a lie, telling a lie. It's not true and yet you did say something. I did say something. It's wrong. I did say it. I did not keep silent. So this universe is not silent. It's there continuously expressing itself to us. Yet it's not real. Even when you take it to the example of gold and the bangle and the necklace and the ring. What is real in all of them is the gold. The bangle and the necklace and the ring, are, you say, are they lies? In one sense, yes. Are there two things, gold and necklace? No. There is only the gold. Necklace is a name and a form and a function. That is, can you show me the necklace apart from the gold? You cannot. There are not two things. There are two words. Gold, necklace. But show me two things. I can show you pen and cap. Two words. I can show you separately. Here is a pen and here is a cap. But if I say necklace and gold, I can't show you two things separately. Pointing there by that necklace, they say in Chandogya Upanishad, Vacharam Bharam Vikara. The necklace has only words for its support. It exists in word, in language. It does not exist in reality. So what is go reality? Gold. Well, gold is only reality compared to the necklace. But gold is not reality compared to the earth element which is composed of. The earth element is not reality com compared to maya from which all the five elements come. Ultimately it goes back to pure consciousness. So other than pure consciousness, no second reality. The three universes are false. You wanted to ask something? Yes. Mm. Um, you talked about truth, silence and lie. The three yes. yes. So what is silence in the, the three worlds? Like how would you define the second statement with relation to the three universes? They are not silence. They are not truth. They are not silence. They are the lie. All three universes are the lie. I am not matching the three universes to truth, silence and lie. None of the three universes are the truth. What is the truth? You, the pure consciousness. Look at it this way. The lake, which I saw outside my door, uh, outside my window. And in the lake I saw three things. I saw a bright morning sky with the sun. One. That's one universe. I saw the cloudy sky. Two. 
that's one universe i saw the dark night with with the with the moon that's the third universe now all three are lies because after all what's there in the lake only water whatever you see it's only water right they are appearances so what about the three three universes i saw in the lake they appear and yet they are not real there in the lake in the same way the three universes which appear to you and you cannot deny they appear to you they appear every day here you are in one of them look then you will be on another one in dreams and then all will merge into a third one which is causal universe darkness all three appear to us every day and yet you are none other than like the water of the lake none other than the awareness in which they come and go in that awareness there is no universe so that awareness is prapancha upashama the silence of the three universes there is a song which we sing in belur math it was one of swami brahmanand's favorite songs um shankari charane mon magno hoye raure oh my mind remain merged in the at the feet of the divine mother shankari is divine mother uh, remain merged in the mind of the divine mother e teen sanshar miche miche bhramiye badaure that these three universes are false in vain do you roam about in them which three universes the waking universe the dream universe and the deep sleep universe how do i roam about them in waking and in dreaming and in deep sleep in vain do you roam about them roam about in these three universes roam about means i'm trying to make a living in these three universes i'm trying to make a living in these three universes but never if it was possible if you ever succeeded god speed to you but we have not succeeded we have just increased our suffering because we are dwelling in falsity that's why we are suffering so much you root yourself in the the background consciousness the fort then all three will be joy to you entertainment like nisarga datta says to a gyani everything is entertainment to the enlightened person everything is entertainment the all three universe you you look at the lake and admire the beauty of the morning sky and the sun in the lake and admire the the melancholy of the clouds in the lake and enjoy the beauty of the darkness and the moon shining in the lake knowing all the time none of them are true they all come and go what persists is the lake right and those three universes they are false they come and go and they are none other than the lake itself you are asking the lake is in and through all of them every bit of those three universes are the lake and the lake is something different from me but here you are the reality so everything in this universe is false and also everything is in this universe is you don't do a equivalence then i am false no <laughs> false means they seem to be separate realities they are not separate realities i am all of this in what sense i am the consciousness in which they appear in which they have no separate identity <coughs> i am alone appear in all these forms yeah imagine if you you were the lake itself this is what it's saying you are the lake prapancha upashamam silence of the three universes all right now note something that which you see in a dream cannot be counted in the waking true hmm? i had a cookie which i liked very much then i went to sleep and I gobbled up three more cookies in dream, and when I wake up, I say, "Oh, I have exceeded my sugar intake. I have taken four cookies." No, you have not. I've taken only one cookie. The three cookies of the dream cannot be counted; they don't exist. If you win a lot of money in the lottery in a dream, that cannot be counted either, unfortunately. <laughs> But at the same time. If you get a ticket in a dream that also is not to be counted you don't have to turn up in court to pay the t- <laughs> no you don't have to so none of them not neither the good nor the desirable nor the undesirable things in a dream are to be counted in other words there's something i'm driving at the 1 2 3 waking dreaming and deep sleep universes are not to be counted why in the fort they have no existence they appear but they have no existence so the fourth has no second 
You, the pure consciousness, which is the fourth, with respect to waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Actually, waking, dreaming and deep sleep are not separate from you. It's not one, two, three and one, two, three and you are fourth. No, you are the one without any second. What happened to those three? They have no independent existence apart from you. Therefore, you are one without a second. Advaitam. But you see the next, there will be a word Advaitam. Shantam Shivam. Advaitam. I'm jumping ahead. I've not forgotten the two words Shantam and Shivam. I'm jumping ahead to Advaitam. Non-dual. That consciousness, which is Ekatma Pratyasaram, which is traced by the one unchanging eye cognition. In that con consciousness, the three universes disappear. They cannot be counted. So that one consciousness is non-dual, without a second reality. You are non-dual, you are a dvaitam, without a second reality. Hmm? That is clear? These two words are very important. Prapanchopashamam, advaitam. The cessation of the three universes or the silence of the universes in you and the non-duality of consciousness which you are. These two words are very important and Gaudapada Acharya, he will write two chapters on them, each word. He will write a chapter, the second chapter is entirely on Prapanchopashama, the silence of the universe, the falsity of the universe. The whole chapter is about the falsity of the universe. He deploys a lot of logic, of reasoning to convince us that the universe, though we experience it, it's only experienced like a dream. It's not real. That's the second chapter. If you want to understand why Advaita keeps on harping on the unreality of the universe, unreality of the world, then the second chapter is for you. We'll, we'll study that eventually. The third chapter, Advaita Prakaranam, which means uh, a chapter on non-duality. The whole chapter is written on this word Advaitam. How are you non-dual? How can we understand it through reasoning and experience? Not just because the Upanishad says so, but reasoning and experience. That's the third chapter. So two whole chapters. I think the second chapter there are 30, uh, six, or 30, 30, 38 verses. And the fourth chapter has 48 verses. So a total of 86 verses he will write about these two words, the cessation of the universe and the non-duality of the self. Because you are non-dual and because the universe is just an appearance on you, then we go back to the word. Then what is the result of this enlightenment? You see, what has to be done is, okay, so this, I'll come back to the, those two words, Shantam, Shivam later on. Let's go ahead. The next word will be Sa Atma, Chaturtam Manyante. Next word is Chaturtham Manyante. People think it is the fourth. What is the fourth? You, the real self. Waker, dreamer, deep sleeper and the fourth. Chaturtham Manyante. People think it is the fourth. The real self is the fourth. Who thinks it is the fourth? Shankaracharya comments. The ignorant people think it is the fourth. What do the knowledgeable people, enlightened people think? It is the one. It is the one. To the ignorant, the fourth. I have learned Mandukya. It says there are four aspects of the self. One, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper and the real aspect, the fourth one, that is me, ignorance. Mandukya keeps on saying it is the fourth. It calls it the fourth also and say those who call it the fourth are ignorant. <laughs> when you re realize the secret of the Mandukya Upanishad, you will see it is the one. Then what about the three? They are not real. It is the gold of which necklace, uh, the bangle and the ring are manifestations. They are not, there is no third, no one necklace, bangle, ring other than the gold. There is no waker, dreamer, sleeper other than the thurium, the, the consciousness, the unchanging consciousness, which you are. So people think it is the fourth, ignorant, and in enlightenment people know it is the one without a second. Uh, So-called fourth is one without a second. It's like this. Oh good, we are doing well for time. So, when we first started, we were told 
Soyam Atma Chatushpat. We are going to inquire into the self. So the, the self has four aspects. Waker, dreamer, sleeper, and turiyam. Now he's saying this is wrong. It's not like this. What's it like? It's like this. The fourth one is this, turiyam. And it alone appears as the waker, as the dreamer, and as the sleeper. Just like gold alone appears as bracelet, on, um, necklace, and ring. Okay with me so far? All right. What else? Sa Atma. All this we are talking about right now, the Turiyam, this one, which appears as the waker and the waker's universe, which appears as the dreamer and the dream universe, which appears as the sleeper and the merged uh, potentiality of deep sleep. All of this, it is that one reality, Turiyam, Sa Atma. It is the self. It's you. It's the real you. Sa Vigyaya. What do you have to do now? Savigya, that has to be realized. Realized means, right now, what we think of ourselves is the waker. Experiencing a waking universe. What the Upanishad suggests we do is, this I, which refers to the waker, the reference has to be changed to Turiyam. You should start thinking of yourself as the fourth. When? Oh, after realization, when I get Samadhi, or at least when we complete the Mandukya course, no, from today, right now onwards. It won't, it won't be any problem at all. It will be all, all, the, all for the good. The sooner you start, the better. It's just acknowledging the truth about yourself. Try to take that standpoint. And the one awareness in which this body and mind has come and I'm experiencing a waking world. Soon this will disappear from, my aware, from this awareness which I am and a dreamer body mind will come and experience a dream world. Soon that will disappear and will experience a blankness. Again the waking will come back. I am the one untouched consciousness. And the waker and the waking world are none other than me. I experience myself as the waker and the waking world. I experience myself as the dreamer and the dream world. That's easy to understand. That I experience myself as the dreamer and the dream world. Just like that. From the pure consciousness point of view, I alone am the waker and the waking world. The whole waking state is nothing like, like, I mean, nothing more than like the sunlight and the sky reflected in the, uh, in the lake. So I am that consciousness. So you have to realize this. Start thinking about it. Start, start thinking that you are it. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Right now. You'll find it's not difficult. It's not difficult. It'll be interesting. Life will become very interesting very soon. <laughs> Uh, that's one. Then what will be the result? Now let me go back to the words I left earlier. Shantam Shivam. Shantam means peace. Not peaceful. The mind can be peaceful. My world can be peaceful. It can be quite peaceful outside. Snowy and quiet and all. That's peaceful. But you are peace itself. Your name is peace. The mind may, may be peaceful, may not be peaceful. But you are peace itself. Shantam. This peace, what does it mean? The end, the cessation of all misery. The end of all suffering. The moment you shift, right now if you do that shifting, you are beyond all misery. Because all misery is in the waking universe and it affects the waker. All misery is in the dream universe, it affects the dreamer. And deep sleeper has no misery as such, but the seed of all misery is there in the deep sleep. It will come out the moment you wake up and, uh, or you dream. So deep sleeper, potential misery, potential for mischief. Dreamer, plenty of mischief there. Waker, lot of mischief. I mean, it's, it's like miserable world. Buddha said, Dukkham, Dukkham, Sarvam, Dukkham. All is Dukkha here. But... From the Turiyam point of view, you can look at the Buddha and say, you are a Buddha. <laughs> I'm joking. Buddha means fool. <laughs> Buddha means the wise one. Uh, so, 
no, the Buddha is not the fool, of course, <laughs> but the Buddha actually stands here and says to us who are here that all your life is, is misery. From this point of view, no misery. Shantam. What problem does this have? Nothing. No problem at all. Okay. By the way, I'm going to, we're going to do a different meditation today. Just now. I'm, al I'm almost done. We'll do that meditation where we'll actually try to stabilize ourselves in the, in the thurium. You might think that's a really ambitious thing to do. It's not. It's considering how you are it. Why, why should it be ambitious at all? You've always been it and it's always available to you. Shantam. And one more word remains. Shivam. Shivam means ananda, bliss. So your real nature is, this one is, bliss itself. Shantam Shivam. Remember, the whole promise of Vedanta was, what will happen at the end of all this exercise? Dukkha Nivritti, exactly. Remember the promise, the selling point. Dukkha Nivritti, Ananda Prapti, what we want in life. This is what connects Vedanta, which seems, might seem like airy speculation and philosophy, with our day-to-day -day requirement of life. We want wellness. We want happiness. We want peace. We want to overcome suffering. That is what is promised here. And that's what the two words stand for. Shantam, transcendence of suffering. Very important word, transcendence. Remember, when the waking universe comes up in, your, in the lake of your awareness, it will bring with it all its suffering. If the body has cancer, it will bring with its cancer. If, if Ramakrishna's hand was broken when he fell down, his samadhi and enlightenment don't change the fact that the hand is broken in the waking appearance. So all of that will come. But here, the lake, it transcends because it's real and that is not real. It transcends. It's not affected by any of that. So remaining in this awareness, you can experience this within yourself without any problem. Transcending the suffering, shantam and shivam. Being bliss. So attainment of bliss and, and transcending suffering was the promise. And that is what is attained if you stabilize yourself here. So you, you said to um, experience Thurim as that which is within you. That is the experiencer or the awareness. And that that's part of everything. How, you know, when I try to... It's neither the experiencer nor is it part of everything. No, but it's... It's the just the opposite. It's the, it's, the, it's the core of the experiencer. It is the light behind the experiencer. That, together with the body-mind, become the experiencer. Pramata. Hmm. So, it's not part of everything. Everything is part of it. And everything is not part of it also. All right. But my question is this, that um, when you ask to imagine, I mean, or to... Just now you said, think of yourself as that consciousness. Hmm. But when you, when, but I am the waker. Hmm. And you are the thurium acting as the waker. Right. It's like the lake saying, think of yourself as the lake, but I am the sun and the sky. How can I be the lake? That's what you're asking. I'm, I'm more asking like, how is the wave? going to think of itself as an ocean. You know, the, the concept of... The wave doesn't ocean. have to think of itself as an ocean. The wave has to think of itself as the water. water. Mm -hmm. Is the wave water or not? So the no, no, tell me. Is the wave water or not? It is, it is. Uh, so is, is there any harm if the wave thinks of itself as water? No, there's only benefit. And is it true if the wave thinks of itself as water? It is. It is. Mm. You, it's like the sun and the sky reflected in the lake and the lake says, how can I, who am the sun and the sky, think of myself as the lake? No, you are the lake. What has happened is your entire attention is on the sun and the sky and you think they are real. They are not real. They are appearing and they will go away. When they go away, if you think you are the sun and the sky, you will weep. I am dying, I am dying, I am gone, I am finished. The cloudy skies come on. You think that's gone and it's something new. No, you are the lake, you were the lake, you are the lake and you will be the lake. Come day or night. Come rain or sunshine or snow, snow, snowfall. Yeah. But my question is how do we think of 
Ourselves as the entire consciousness versus ah, part of it. That's entire consciousness and part of it. Yeah. Think about it. D- does anybody have an answer to that? There is no entire and part. Think about it. When you are, just think about it. When you, you have now woken up from, from your dream. It's like the dreamer saying, how can I think of myself as the entire world? How can I think of myself as the entire world? But when you wake up from the, you don't have to go to Turi, you have to wake up from dreamer to waker. Are you not the entire world of the dreamer? Yes. Ah. From, the, from the consciousness point of view, again, the language is important. You are not entire consciousness or part of consciousness. Entirety and part are all appearances in consciousness. Consciousness itself has no entirety or parts. When you think of yourself as entire and part, that is Vishishtadvaita. This is the crucial difference between Vishishtadvaita and Advaita. Part and whole relationship, Vishishtadvaita. Oneness, a radical oneness, Advaita, non-duality. Okay, there is no other. There is no whole and part also. There is no big and small. See, when I say ocean, wave and water, it's still the feeling. You know what the feeling will be? The ocean has lots of water. And the wave has a little bit of water. So I am the water and ocean is also water. But not quite exactly the same water. Because ocean has lots of water and I am only a little bit of water. No. That's, they don't extend the example. That's why the examples are double-edged swords. They will put an idea into you. They can clarify something. But they will put an idea into your mind. Which will take a lot of hard work to clarify. Yeah. Which one? Which path? Yes. No. Yeah, but tell me. Lucid dreaming in the waking world, there's like a, a grayish line. You're really not going to tell the difference. You, you talk to people, you smell people, and then when you wake up, you, you don't know if you're dreaming again or whatever. Right, right. Awake, so. mm. I mean, it's a dangerous path, but some people do take that path. And it's, it's useful. The Tibetan Buddhists have something called dream yoga. In fact, they did it at the Rubin Museum uh, last year. They, they had a program. You had to sign, out, sign up for it. Then you go to the museum in your pajamas. <laughs> and then you get to sleep. You, you can choose the Buddha you want to sleep under. So the Buddha's statue is there or the picture icon. And you sleep there with your uh, bedding. And you dream. <coughs> you say, what if I don't dream? Don't worry about it. They'll take care of it. You, you go to sleep. And somewhere in the night, you'll be woken up by these people in, I guess, in white lab coats or whatever. And they're going to immediately, they'll wake you up when you are in REM sleep and ask you about your dreams. And so night after night, they will take that. So, and then it is analyzed, not in a Freudian sense, but in a, in the, for this purpose, to see that, that there's no difference between waking and dreaming. Like the Chinese philosopher who dreamt he was a butterfly, butterfly and he woke up and he thought, Am I a philosopher dreaming that I am a butterfly or am I a butterfly dreaming that I am a philosopher? So that's the danger of the lucid dreaming path. I had a friend, a monk, uh, I have, a long time ago when he was a student, he practiced this. And he said he stopped, he could actually could, the, the two experiences melted into each other. And he stopped, he got a bad shock when uh, the two worlds became interpenetrated. There were elements and people and events from the dream world coming into his waking world. And so he could not tell the difference and that alarmed him so much he stopped doing that. Uh, but it's a very interesting experience. Yes. Uh, so I have a bit of a problem with the Advaita aspect of it. Mm. If we are saying that the gold uh, is what is real and it is just appearing as the negatives of the ring. Right. Uh, then because of Maya. Yeah. And then we are also saying that Maya is just gold, uh, ultimately, because there is nothing else like yes, it, yes, nothing separate from yes. Maya. Yeah. Then, uh, if there is nothing separate, then why would there be a necklace or a ring? Why just there not, isn't just go- But like, why is it just not gold in no form? Why is there no form? Why why is there sometimes form and sometimes no form? That's what you are saying. Why do we here, for example, why do we cycle through? Waker, dreamer, sleeper, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Why not pure consciousness as pure consciousness? That's all. Right? That's the thing which we discussed earlier. Do you remember? Before we went into the seventh mantra, Gaurapada asks this question, why? 
And there were different answers. Why does the one appear as the many? The same question. So, one answer was Maya. One answer was it's, you know, the devotional answers, the play of God. There are many, many answers possible. What was Gaudapada's final answer? It's its very nature. You look at the, the Karika number 9, I think. Karika, Gaudapada's Karika number 9. It's not a question that is raised in the Upanishad, but Gaudapada raises He knows that we will ask this question. So he raises this in Karika number 9. Yes, number 9. Bhogartham srishti rityanye kridartham iti chapare so different theories are given. Some say it is because that consciousness wants to enjoy itself. Actually a pretty deep answer. You remember Alan Watt's story? God wanted to play hide and seek. Kridartam because of play. It's Leela, the divine play of God. So devotees might want to think about it that way. But Gaurapada doesn't buy any of it, including the Maya theory. Advaita's answer is Maya. Because of Maya, it appears in these forms. But Gaudapada doesn't buy any of that. He says, Devasyesha Swabhavayam. This is how the fourth shines. If you say, why did the sun become the light? It could have remained as the sun. But being the sun means radiating light. Isn't it? The sun, being what it is, means it pours out light and heat. In the same way, the thurium is what it is. It pours out the universe. It, it shines as the universe. A gross way of looking at it would be, universe is real, then thurium becomes God for us, the creator of the universe. Every theistic religion says, God is the creator of the universe. But you look at it this way, then it's not a real universe. It's not a separate universe. If it's not a separate universe, then you must be Thurium yourself. And then you yourself are this universe. Yeah. Yes? I'd like to be able to distinguish between the word inherent nature and creature. Because hmm. if, according to that line of Gaurav Patacharya, that it is its inherent nature, then it sort of leads you to believe that you would never reach a point where you would be able to separate that from what else it is. But we are endeavoring to experience consciousness without the Maya, right? Hmm. Uh, actually, no. If you're trying to experience consciousness without the Maya, it, there is no way of experiencing it. The only way is, is through this. At the most, well, you, will, you will try to do what yogis try to do, nirvikalpa samadhi. Shut it all down and remain as this for a while. You know what Gaudapada would say to that? Why go through all that trouble? You get it every night in deep sleep. <laughs> you get it in ignorance. The yogi gets it in knowledge, in, in awareness. There's a, you, there's a use to that because through that nirvikalpa samadhi, when you come out of it, you become enlightened. You're, you know the truth. In deep sleep, you come out of it, you're just refreshed. That's all. So, but the only way we see is this. What else can it be? Other than this means you want to shut this down. Shutting it down is going into a potential state, in, into a blankness. Yeah. Either you will see a blankness or the subtle universe or the gross universe. And there's no harm to it because none, they, are, they are now entertainment, they are movies, they are Hollywood now. <laughs> mm. It's the separation and the reality and your limitation that makes for misery and horror. If it's oneness, there's no misery. It's all joy. All right. Now, let me... I'll just share one or two points which I had noted from Shankaracharya's commentary. Very interesting points. Then we'll go into the meditation. Did you have a question? Did somebody have a question? No. No? All right. Here is Shankaracharya. He has a question. Um... I have mentioned this already. I'll read it out. It's from Shankara's commentary. So he starts with the question. When the Atman has been declared to have four aspects and three aspects have been described, it seems obvious that the fourth is different from these three. That's why you say it's fourth. 
So you should tell us about it. Why are you starting by saying it's not the waker, it's not the dreamer, it's not the sleeper? This is the question which we raised earlier. This is, a very, this is how Shankaracharya starts his commentary. Answer. It is only by denying the imagined snake that one gets access to the rope, which is the substratum of the illusion. If I say, if you are seeing a snake, I tell you the uh, reality is the rope. What will you do? You'll start running around for looking for a rope. But if I tell you, it's not a snake, look closely, it's a rope, then only you will find the rope. Denying the snake is part of realizing it to be a rope. Correct? Similarly, you have to start by denying all this to see the underlying reality. You have to start by saying, it's not a sky and a sun and a moon and a clouds, it's a lake. All right. The realizing the fourth, an intuitive grasp of the fourth requires us to realize the falsity of the three. The fourth is the substratum of three appearances. Then, next question. Is Turiya, the fourth one, quite apart from waker, dreamer and deep sleeper? Your question, you know. Is Turiya a separate entity? No. Turiya, if it were a se totally separate from the three, if it were totally separate from the three, then what will happen? For want of a door to enter into the Turiyam, it would always remain unknown to us. If it were something entirely separate from the three, all that we know are these three. If it's a fourth reality, all I'm giving you are three ornaments. A necklace, a bangle and a ring. Now if I tell you there is a separate reality called gold, if gold is something separate from that, those three, you'll never get the gold. You have only those three. We have only these three in our ex experience. So it, ha it is not something separate from them. Then, then a related question. The three states differ from each other, right? Waker, dreamer and sleeper, they differ from each other. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Because the events of the waking, if you eat and go to sleep, there's no guarantee that you won't be hungry in your dream. It might be. It doesn't affect. The three states and their diff answer, differences are all false. All imagined or superimposed on the reality, Brahman, which is called Turiya. In reality, the waker is none other than Turiya. The sleeper and dreamer are none other than Turiya. Can I ask hmm. So, Swami, from your first question, hmm. it appears, I mean, is it right that my understanding is that Turiya exists hmm. in and through these three experiences that we go through, hmm. but it exists even without them? Even without them, yes. So, but we can only experience it through these because that's the, our, that's who, yeah. our experience. Yeah. These three are experienced because of Turiyam. That's what Turiyam does for these three. And what do these three do for Turiyam? They manifest Turiyam. Yeah. Yeah. But the difference, the, the difference is this. These three depend on Turiyam for their existence. Turiyam does not depend on them for their ex existence. Okay. Yes. It is possible for Turiyam to exist without these three manifestations. True, true. Then why must we say that Maya is an inherent nature or as we learned Gaurapadacharya gave an explanation, mm. that is the very nature of Turiyam. Yes, true. No, Maya is not inherent na nature of Turiyam. Your question is why are these three appearing? That was the question. To answer that question, Gaudapada said, it's the very nature of Turiyam to appear as these three. But suppose Turiyam does not appear as these three, it is possible? Yes, it's possible. But your explanation, your question was, why are these three coming at all? And the answer was, because of play, because of enjoyment, or because of our karma. Some said, because of, you know, um, God can create the universe, so God creates the universe. 
Some said Maya and Gaudapada said it's the very nature of that to shine forth in this way. Yes. No, it's not that state. That's what I'm saying. Samadhi is somewhat like consciously going into deep sleep. Where you can shut down these experiences and remain as pure consciousness. The yogi can cultivate that. It's a difficult process. The yogi can cultivate that. It's like saying, what you are asking is, can I experience gold in itself without any ornament? You're saying that uh, maybe it's a lump of gold. It's still something. Still, still something. It's still, it's still a form. Yeah. So if you want to experience it, then it must have some name and form. Right? And not only that, the Advaita says the whole question is twisted. Why? You are desperately trying to have Turiyam in itself without these things. It's like, can I get gold? It's somehow I feel this is a necklace. No matter if you say necklace is false, false. The real gold I want. It's the real gold. So it's only in the knowing that we get to the reality of it. Not ah. Don't try to change your experience. You may try to change and get unique experiences. That's the yogi mentality. The Advaita mentality is whether you see Turiyam as in deep Nirvikalpa Samadhi or you are having a cup of coffee into your breakfast, Advaita says it's exactly the same. It's a very radical statement. But, but I won't say it. it it's damaging to religion and so... <laughs> so I won't say it again. It's a damaging statement. Because you simply you read Yoga Sutra. What is the whole purpose of yoga? Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the suppression of the modifications, modifications of the mind. If you if you if the modifications of the mind cease, then for you, for the yogi, your waking universe, dream universe will disappear. And yet it will not be deep sleep also. We have not fallen asleep, we have consciously shut down the mind. Then you realize. After all of this is gone, I still am whatever I was. When your mind starts functioning again, when you come out of Samadhi, you will realize I am not the waker. I am that which I experienced in Samadhi. That's enlightenment. It's like watching, a, I'll come to you, watching a movie. Watching a movie and telling you that see the movie is not real. The screen behind the movie is real. One good way of understanding that is to switch off the movie. And show you the screen. Then put on the movie again. Then you will understand the movie, what the movie is and what the screen is. This is the movie. This is the screen. So the, 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 the yogi going into samadhi understands that after coming out of... Ah, samadhi. this is a very subtle point but many people do not understand. See, we are very nicely going along, sailing along. You might think you're beginners, but you're asking questions which after years of study in yoga and Vedanta, people come to this epiphany. Oh, enlightenment is not possible in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. When is enlightenment possible? Enlightenment is knowledge. Knowledge is possible when the mind works. So, you may go a very prepared mind. The moment the flash of knowledge comes, that person may be thrown into Samadhi. So Samadhi may come just after enlightenment or after Nirvikalpa Samadhi when you wake up, you are enlightened. But the, the flash of knowledge, I am Turiyam, not the waker. I am Brahman. That cannot happen in Samadhi because the mind is shut down there. Yes. yes. The knowledge comes in the mind and it removes the ignorance in the mind. 
In Samadhi, what remains? Turiya alone remains. Does Turiya have ignorance? No. Does it need knowledge? No. But what needs knowledge is the waker. So when you come up, but that's yoga. What Vedanta says, why go to all that trouble? Vedanta says, all you have to do is come to class. <laughs> yes. Wait. The, if you regard that, um, some people say that in an intuitive grasp, an intuitive flash that comes in Samadhi, afterwards you realize it. So there is a teacher in Chennai, a Swami, who very humorously said that the Vedantic approach, the yogic approach is that through Samadhi you get an intuitive grasp. And the Advaitic approach is that in Advaita we believe, we don't believe in intuition, we believe in tuition. <laughs> tuition, in tuition. What we are having here is tuition, right? <laughs> so that's what we believe in. Come to class, you don't spare yourself the trouble of 30 years of uh, yogic meditation. So, of course, this is also troublesome. You have to wade through snow and all to come to class. Okay, now you had questions very quickly. I just want to say one thing in that regard. Sri Ramakrishna in, in the gospel says that you yeah. have to be pure. Minded. Yeah. Hmm. I, like, I can come to every Montague Upanishad class and go away not understanding the depth of, which is probably happening to me almost every day, hmm. but understanding the depth of what you're saying because of the lack of purity of my mind. Hmm. And therefore, I should do the yogic practices or the mantra and all of that meditation in order to make my mind pure. Correct. Correct. Advaita also I says that. able to understand the depth of what you're saying. True, true. Advaita also says that. Advaita says that. Here is the teaching. Did you get it? No. Okay. What you do now is karma yoga, bhakti yoga and... Dhyana Yoga. Meditate. Here is a deity. Here is a mantra. Worship the deity. Love God. Do unselfish activities. Cleanse, cleanse the instrument. And when, when do I come back to class? 20 years later? No. Keep coming to class. Keep coming to class. You never know when it might awaken. And you see, one thing is, just by repeated listening to this, how much of it becomes clear? It's now, I can see it. You know, I don't know how, whether you appreciate it or not. I, I've been teaching for more than 25 years now. So I can see quite clearly how far along people are. Many people are beginning to get it. It's beginning to clear up, at least intellectually it's beginning to clear up. What is this about? What are they talking about? The, the thrilling thing is they're talking about you right here, right now. So... All spiritual practices are welcome. But remember, this is the highest spiritual practice that we are doing. We always have this in our mind. I will read about it, study about it, take notes. And then when I get time, I'll practice it and get something. That's the yogic attitude. This reading about it, listening about it, thinking about it, which we are doing right now, is Shravana Manana. The first two steps of Advaitic practice. Okay, one more point and I'm done. Um, there was this Swami who passed away a long time ago, Akhandananda Saraswati, in Mathura. He, um, in Vrindavan, he was a great non-dualist, a very great, very great scholarly Swami. Unfortunately, all, all his works are in uh, Hindi. There were some attempts to translate into English, but the English is poor. But um, he wrote two classics. One is Bhagavatam. Wrote means he gave talks and they were made into books. So two big volumes of Bhagavatam in Hindi. That's the devotional. And then Mandukya Karika, this one. It's really a classic. Four volumes, four chapters, four big volumes on each chapter. Or one volume on each chapter. And in that, he has a chapter on the seventh mantra, this one. I was, when I studied it first, I was so thrilled. He makes several points about this, uh, observations about the seventh mantra. I counted how many distinct observations or points he has mentioned about the seventh mantra, one which we did? 125. If you do even 10 per day, it's going to take you a dozen classes <laughs> to go through all of those points. So anyway, Akhandananda huh? Saraswati. If you understand Hindi, it's a, it's a very good book to read. Four volumes in Mandukya Upanishad. Excellent. 
very thrilling how he can make dry philosophy dance you know um one more point and here many points uh, many of these points have taken from him um this is taken from anandagiri who wrote a commentary on shankaracharya's commentary on gaudapada's commentary on the mandukya so so mandukya upanishad Sh- gaudapada shankaracharya then anandagiri anandagiri makes a comment if turiya be totally distinct from waker dreamer deep sleeper then there can be no upaya upaya connection which means method and object to be attained upaya means method and upaya means the end to be attained there oh let's put it this way there can be no means and end connection the philosophical analysis of waker dreamer and deep sleeper will therefore be unable to reveal turiya so if the turiya were absolutely separate from all of this then they, you see this is only a method methodology what's so great about talking about waker and waking universe we know all that you can't you should say you can't fool me with uh, fancy words like uh, vishwa and virat and things like that uh, i know all this this is my day to day life get down to the real stuff and upanishad has only one real stuff to say turiyam so this is the end which to, to be realized this is the means shankaracharya uses a very beautiful phrase pratipatti dwara bhutam the three states are the door to knowledge knowledge of what that one yes the turiya the fourth so we are using this which is common to all of us which we know as a door to the understanding of turiya after knowing this you yeah, have all sadhanas are welcome if you want to live sri ram krishna said after enlightenment you live as a devotee with the love of god and the devotees of god bhakti bhakto bhagavan yathaka e pakamat this is the final conclusion after realizing turiya what happens you are again back to the waker here you are now what does this enlightened waker do he has woken up from waking he has woken up from waking what does he do he still has the waking world to live in so lives as a devotee that's the sri ramakrishna's conclusion think of the turiya as god and live in this world with other devotees worshiping and loving god that's what sri ramakrishna did for him the turiya was divine mother and the child and she is a divine mother so that's one way another way could be the gyani's way you are back to the waker but it's an enlightened waker now so instead of saying i am the waker in this my waking world you say i am the turiya so right here right here we are now right here so i am the turiya and this and this all of these are me none other than me the reality so it's a gyani's way of existing okay now let's do a little exercise and stop just put everything down and sit relaxed nothing short of realizing the turiyam right away now 5 minutes all of this you know the bhagavad gita i was reading krishna's teaching on meditation makes perfect sense if you look at it this way you know what he says let the mind be guided by the intellect stabilized in this knowledge with your intellect steady in this knowledge guide the mind and the senses stabilize yourself in the self which is turiyam do not think of anything else the moment you think of anything else these three will come up in this way he says slowly little by little steady yourself in the reality it makes perfect sense now right he is talking about it in 6th chapter in gita to arjuna without mentioning turiya three stages nothing okay now what you do is relax breathing in and breathing out normally all right now open your eyes look look at the world 
center your consciousness, your awareness in the eyes, if possible in your right eye. Center means I am here. Who am I? I am here. I am looking out into the world. This is my world, waking world. I am the waker in this body. Here I am in this eye. This is the first aspect. Steady in the first aspect. See this. This is, this is my world. I, the waker, who am here in the right eye, looking out, staring into this world, my world, my waking world. Now gently close your eyes. Retreat as it were into the head, inside the head, into the mind. Stay with the mind, thoughts, ideas, memories, thinking, feeling, the mind centered inside the head, as it were. This is the second aspect of the self. Mind-centered, the consciousness turned into the mind, which obtains in dream. But here, in the waking itself, you can get it by centering yourself inside the head, in the mind, in the midst of the mind. Notice it. Don't have to do anything. If no thoughts come, good. You are the witness of the no thoughts. <coughs> Second aspect of the self, of yourself. Now slowly descend your awareness, center of awareness to a space in the middle of your chest, inside your chest. The center of your chest. Imagine a luminous space. Settle down there, your center of awareness, and there itself, powerfully imagine the state of deep sleep. You cannot hear anything, see anything, smell, touch, taste anything. No external world. No thoughts and memories. You don't remember your name. We don't see any images or dreams. You don't recall anything. You don't desire anything. Even the thought that I am in deep sleep, that also goes away. Be in that space within your chest. Quiet. No external world. No mental world, quiet. Imagine the deepest sleep possible. That is your third state, third aspect. Nothing outside, nothing inside. Like deep sleep. Now, drop that too. You are not aware of an external world. You are not aware of thoughts and emotions. You are not asleep. That which you are cannot be seen or heard or touched or tasted or smelt. You can't catch hold of it. Don't even try to think of it. It cannot be thought of. Yet every thought shines in its light. You cannot speak of it.
notice that that one has always been there in your waking, in your dreaming, in your deep sleep. It's always there. Yet it is beyond the three universes of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. It is prapancha upashamam. It is peace itself, shantam. It is bliss and auspiciousness, shivam. It is the real you, the Turiyam. If sensations come, don't be agitated. Just note that's the first aspect of Turiyam. If thoughts and emotions come, questions come, feelings come, don't be agitated. That's just your second aspect. If nothing comes, a blankness, a tiredness, a restfulness, that's just your third aspect. All of them come and appear and disappear in the light which you are, the Turiyam. I will state the Mahavakya, the great statement from the Upanishads. I will chant it and you chant it mentally, not aloud. Three times. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Let us chant Om together three times, after which you will slowly open your eyes. Om. Open your eyes if you like. Back to the first aspect. <laughs> Remember, it's a very common sense and rational as uh, approach. You're not even pretending that we went into some mystic state. No, no, we are all along in the waking state. We're just using our um, <coughs> understanding to note the Turiyam, which is always available. 